So yeah, my name is Gabby. Um, it is an absolute delight to be here to talk about my work. I promise I won't talk too much about experiment. It will be mostly computational, but I do like to sprinkle in a little bit of experiment here and there. So today I'm going to be speaking about um, intrinsically disordered proteins. And I know that proteins, oh, my slides do not seem to be, oh, here we are. Okay, so yes, today we're going to be speaking about intrinsically disordered proteins. And so proteins have gotten a lot of attention recently, of course, with AlphaFold2 mm -hmm. has um, given us a wonderful opportunity to understand and probe protein three-dimensional shapes and structures. But unfortunately, for intrinsically disordered proteins, AlphaFold2 doesn't really help us understand their shapes, oh, suffice it to say, <laughs> their shapes and um, therefore functions. So um, shown on my, or your, the right here, uh, is a structure of lysozyme, uh, which we've known the structure thanks to wonderful X-ray crystallography, and you can also use cryo-EM to learn the shapes of proteins, but neither cryo-EM, X-ray crystallography, um, or AlphaFold2 can help us understand the shapes of intrinsically disordered proteins. And that's because they're very much like wet spaghetti flopping around in solution. And I like to think of them using a statistical mechanics approach, thinking about them as a structural ensemble, such as each state has a corresponding weight or probability of being occupied. And the conformational heterogeneity of disorder proteins is really useful for biology because it allows um, one biomolecule to respond in very different ways depending on the environment. So the presence of salt conditions can change the structural ensemble, pH, or various other binding partners, both structured and unstructured. And so because they can have so many different structures and therefore functions, we often find disordered proteins as hubs in networking and signaling processes. But when things go wrong with these proteins, they can go very wrong. And we find intrinsically disordered proteins involved in a wide variety of diseases, including all of the ones listed here, several of which are extremely prevalent for our society today. And so the focus of my research is trying to understand how we can target intrinsically disordered proteins therapeutically with small molecules, because this represents an enormous untapped therapeutic opportunity that's been largely overlooked by mainstream pharmaceutical industries. And so to really get at this question, I try to break down my research into two more specific questions, namely, can disordered proteins be targeted by small molecules or drugs? And if so, how does this binding occur? And what I mean by how does this binding occur is what are the underlying biophysical principles that govern a small molecule to come together with a disordered protein and interact with it? And so I just like to take a step back and talk about how we generally think about small molecule interactions with proteins. And so I know this is very introductory material for this audience, but of course, in our um, Biochemistry 101 courses were taught about the lock and key drug binding mechanism, whereby a small molecule will come into an active site or a binding site, much like a key fits into a lock. And while this, as we know, is a bit of an oversimplification of the process, we can be very quantitative about these interactions in terms of an overall bi favorable binding free energy, which in turn can be broken down into two components, namely favorable enthalpy or stickiness between the drug and the protein, and of course, entropy. Now, enthalpy has to do, sorry, enthalpy has to do with favorable salt bridges, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals forces, charge charge interactions, et cetera. And entropy can be favorable in the case of small molecule binding to a structured protein via the release of bound waters in that binding pocket. So as the drug comes into that binding pocket, rigid water molecules can get pushed out. And as their degrees of freedom increase, um, that is a favorable contribution of entropy. Of course, the drug, as it goes from the bulk solvent to that binding site, it is losing entropy. And the protein, depending on what happens, maybe it rigidifies, maybe it becomes more dynamic. It's sort of a case-by-case -case basis. But in the case of intrinsically disordered proteins, we really don't know what this binding looks like. And that's for two reasons. First and foremost, we don't have very many examples of small molecules that are known to interact with intrinsically disordered proteins. And secondly, we don't have very many uh, tools to study these interaction processes. And so that's where um, my research comes in. We use integrative methods, combining computation and experiment to get at this question. And in particular, throughout my career, I've studied several different systems, ranging from intrinsically disordered proteins involved in cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and currently I'm working on the hepatitis C virus. 
But today I'm going to tell you a story about the amyloid beta peptide, which undergoes a very complex self-assembly process from an intrinsically disordered protein into the fibular species associated with the onset of Alzheimer's disease. But all of these systems and the small molecules I'm going to show you today really have to uh, for us are model systems for us to really probe the underlying biophysical mechanisms. And so these really aren't um, at this stage therapeutic drugs. We're just really trying to understand what are the rules governing this process. And so I've mentioned that amyloid beta is an intrinsically disordered protein that undergoes this complex self-assembly. In particular, what we see is that intrinsically disordered monomers will first self-associate into these small oligomeric species and then get in converted into these fibular species via a process we call primary nucleation. And then once a critical concentration of fibrils is reached, the surface of the fibrils can actually act as a positive feedback loop to rapidly generate many more fibrils via a process we call secondary nucleation. Importantly, um, the intrinsically disordered monomer is involved in both primary and secondary nucleation, and intrinsically disordered monomers can grow the fibrils in length via a process called elongation. Okay, so we can study this process um, in the lab using a fibril specific dye that tells us the quantity of fibrils that are present. Uh, that dye is called thioflavin T. And this is what an aggregation curve looks like. So over time, we can see the increase of fibrils that are formed. And so to make a long story quite short, I identified a small molecule with a terrible name, 10074G5, or G5 for short, which can inhibit this aggregation process in a concentration dependent manner. Um, so we see a delay in the aggregation and a change in the final fibril load. Working with mathematicians, we were able to describe or fit these kinetic uh, uh, aggregation reactions using a very simple model, which we call monomer sequestration, where we only have one free parameter, and that's namely the affinity between the small molecule and amyloid beta. So essentially by sequestering out monomer, we can describe this aggregation process. And that free parameter is effectively a KD, which we get in the low micromolar range. We verified a direct binding to the intrinsically disordered monomer using a surface-based technique. I'm not gonna spend too long on this, but it's called biolayer interferometry. And again, we see an affinity constant in the low micromolar range. One more experiment, I promise. When we tried to study this with NMR, um, what we, we couldn't see very much. So what I'm showing here is um, a type of experiment which you can think of as a chemical fingerprint. Essentially, each spot in our spectrum corresponds to a unique position in the disordered protein backbone. And what we see is that when we add the small molecule, we don't see changes. Normally for a folded protein, this is a state-of-the-art technique uh, for looking at where drugs bind in folded proteins. You'll see these beautiful chemical shift perturbations, we call these chemical shifts, where you'll see the peaks moving, and that will tell you exactly where changes are happening in the protein. Either the protein, um, you're learning about the protein binding site, or you'll learn about allosteric changes. But when we tried this experiment with our disordered protein, we don't see any changes. And that was really puzzling to us. Why can we see this with some techniques and not others? And so something I wanna say about chemical shift is that this is an ensemble average technique. We are measuring all of the uh, molecules in our test tube at the same time, and we are getting an average picture. And I know this audience needs no introduction to this, but averages are not the same as distributions. And so to illustrate that point, all of these points have this nearly the same average or mean in the X and Y dimensions. They also have almost the same standard deviations in both of these dimensions. But what we can see is that the distributions themselves are very, very different. And so we wondered, could this be what was going on with amyloid beta? Is it possible that the average behavior is very, very similar, but the distributions of the intrinsically disordered protein were somehow changing in the presence of the small molecule? And so to address that question, we performed all atom molecular dynamic simulations. Um, something that's challenging about intrinsically disordered proteins in contrast to folded proteins is that uh, for a folded protein, you have really well-defined free energy landscape with one or two um, very uh, well-defined free energy minima. A disordered protein, your free energy landscape is much more rugged and much more shallow. And so it's a much more challenging problem because you have to get many more minima correct. And just to show how challenging this can be for disordered proteins, while generally force field, protein force fields are quite good at predicting these minima, um, this is a wonderful study in which the author took a model peptide called the RS peptide because it's rich in arginine and serine residues. 
and simulated it using several state-of-the-art force fields for intrinsically disordered proteins. And what they show is that the radii of gyration predicted by these force fields is very, very different depending on the choice of force field. And so just a word of warning that you can't always trust what your simulations are telling you. And depicted another way, here are representations of the structural ensembles. And you can just see how different they are depending on the cho choice of force field. And so as a way to make sure that we are really representing um, what the experiments are telling us, we use an approach called metadynamic meta-inference. And I'm gonna first start by explaining meta-inference. So meta-inference is a Bayesian approach that allows us to combine prior information, in this case, coming from our force fields with a data likelihood, which in this case is gonna come from our NMR data. And what, that, what we can get out of it is a posterior ensemble that maximizes the agreement between the two approaches. On top of this, we use metadynamics which is an enhanced sampling technique that allows us to get full coverage of our very rugged free energy landscape. So in particular with metadynamics, um, we have a collective variable, uh, for example, the radius of gyration, and we apply a, a bias to discourage our states from visiting states that it's already explored. But because we can remember these biases at the end of our simulation, we can then reconstruct our full free energy landscapes. On top of this, we also have to take special care um, in terms of the small molecules. So when we introduce these small molecules into our force fields that have been optimized for proteins, oftentimes um, these organic molecules, small organic molecules will be just uh, kind of approximated as the closest amino acid. So we actually go back to the quantum mechanics and do a very careful parameterization. Okay, so a few extra details about how we set up our simulation. We chose the Charm 22 star force field with tip 3P water because it was best at recapitulating experimental observables. We're using chemical shift restraints using meta-inference metadynamics. Um, and we used 48 replicas for a total of 20 microsecond simulation time. And for this work, I had the privilege of using the beautiful Mari Nostrum Supercomputing Center in Barcelona, which is housed in a desanctified church. Very cool. Okay, so we were really interested in trying to answer this question, why do the NMR data suggest that we see no change, but we can see binding other ways? And why do we have this inhibition of aggregation? So we first decided to look at average contact maps. And so what I'm showing here are two contact maps in this top um, Left-hand corner, we have Leonard Jones interaction energies for A beta alone and A beta in the presence of the small molecule. And in the bottom corners, we have Coulombic interaction energies. And so what you can see on average is that these two peptides in the presence and absence of the small molecule behave very, very similarly. And this is in complete agreement with the NMR data that we have. If we also look at the distributions of the radii of gyration, again, we see that these distributions don't change very dramatically in the presence and absence of the small molecule. However, if we look at the relative hydrophobic solvent accessible surface area, there is where we start to see some changes. So in the presence of the small molecule, the disordered peptide seems to be adopting conformations that are less hydrophobic. And this may explain why we see this decreased aggregation propensity in the presence of the small molecule. We can also look at interactions at a residue by residue basis in terms of Leonard Jones and Coulombic interaction energies. What we can see um, right off the bat is that all of these residues in some way are involved in the interaction with strong interactions in terms of aromatic residues. And it's predominated by Leonard Jones interactions, but charge charge interactions are also favorable. Okay, so we can learn that enthalpic interactions are um, favorable, but they may be very weak and delocalized. What about entropy? What could be going on here? And in particular, I was very interested in the entropy from the perspective of the intrinsically disordered protein. And I envisioned three possible scenarios, sort of a spectrum of things that could happen with um, three uh, general cases. On the one hand, there could be a scenario which we call entropic collapse. So we're going from many states of our disorder protein to one state. Maybe it's folding up upon interacting with our small molecule. On the other extreme is a case that I call entropic expansion, where we're going from many states to somehow even more states. So somehow the small molecule is enabling 
the uh, intrinsically disordered protein to increase its conformational entropy. And in the middle is a scenario I call isentropic shift, where from the perspective of the protein, we have no increase nor a decrease in conformational entropy. And so to try and quantify this, I performed a clustering analysis where I grouped my disordered protein into states based on um, uh, Leonard Jones interaction maps. And what we see is that in the presence of the small molecule, we have many more states and many of them have lower weights, suggesting that we're observing an increase in the conformational entropy in the presence of the small molecule. This was independent of the cutoff that we use with the exception of extremely large cutoffs where all of our states were grouped into one um, giant state. Um, and this was also independent of the type of clustering that we do. Um, and we can also look at it from the perspective of um, binning things in terms of Ramachandran space. So at a per residue basis, we can see that we, for the majority of the disorder protein, we have an increase in entropy with the exception of uh, a small change, a decrease in the C terminus. Okay, but um, there were two limitations with this approach. One is that we lose the dynamic information by using metadynamics and also figuring out how to cluster this protein. Well, Leonard Jones um, interaction maps in the end proved uh, very useful. It was very difficult to uh, figure that out. And that was probably the 11th way I tried to, to cluster um, the different states. And so um, in collaboration with uh, Google AI, um, this is the work of Thomas Lohr, um, we were able to run very, very long vanilla molecular dynamic simulations, totaling in 315 microseconds of total simulation time um, to build a neural network of, um, in, in such a way such that we could group our different states of our disorder protein using essentially a soft state assignment approach. So by using the uh, dimension of time, we could build a Markov state model. So we use time to uh, separate out different conformations. And essentially each state has, each frame of our MD has a probability of being signed to a certain state, which allowed us to build this Markov state model. Um, we can pick how many different uh, states we want. Um, so this can be broken down anywhere from two to however many states that you would like. And this is particularly useful in the context of small molecule binding. So what we learn from this analysis is that this small molecule seems to affect inter-residue contact formation, but not contact dissociation. Um, additionally, from this analysis, we can learn about contact lifetimes and contact probabilities projected onto the small molecule. And what's very nice about this approach is that we can correlate um, regions which we see are particularly important for um, binding the disorder peptide and perform a quantitative structure activity relationship on, study on this in the aggregation assays. And we find that um, these are the exact regions that we find we cannot remove. Okay, so I'm cognizant that I don't have a lot of time, um, but just want to say that um, it is a very exciting time to be studying intrinsically disordered proteins and their interactions. Um, open questions include how general are these mechanisms? Are there new experimental and computational tools that will allow us to um, further answer questions about this interesting biophysics that we're exploring? Um, what are the roles of specificity and can we use these approaches to modulate liquid liquid phase separation? And so with that, I would just like to thank Jarell and the organizers for the opportunity to be here today um, and state that all of our analysis and trajectories are available online should you wish to take a look.